Thank you, David. Hi, Wired. Um, I'm really glad to be here. It's a great honor. I'm a bit nervous about being in the session after lunch because obviously we were trying to work out the name of the, the sugar lag that comes after lunch. Um, but I'm really glad that I'm speaking before Rory Sutherland, which is, uh, phew, otherwise we'll all be in trouble. This is an 82-year-old monk in a little village called Roca in Cambodia. And uh, he's celibate. He's the uh, abbot of the village, a village of about 1,000 people. And he's just recently become HIV positive. This is the grandmother and grandfather, or great-grandmother and grandfather of a, a family of about 70 close members in the same village. And they're subsistence rice farmers. And um, this is the great-grandmother holding up her meds because she's just recently become HIV positive. And so have 19 other members of her family. This is another family in Rocker, Cambodia. Um, and everyone in that photograph has recently become HIV positive, apart from the father at the back. And this all came from the most probably surprising element of of treatment in this village, which they all were infected by an injection. The local quack, who was also the money lender in the village, was uh, administering injections time and time again for 20 years, probably with reused equipment and changing them very infrequently. But when HIV entered into the system, it spread like wildfire throughout the community. And 272, I think that was back in, in February, 272 people out of around 1,000 people were infected. And uh, some are dying, including the great grandmother who just recently passed away. This is something that I've been doing a long time. And I see the most bizarre examples. These are children in Indonesia playing with used syringes um, as a game. Water pistols, great fun. Um, but after the, you know, the intricate point scoring of hitting each other with water, um, they drank from the syringes, which were, had dried blood inside them. In Pakistan, I took this photograph of uh, kids who recycle these products as a living. They don't go to school. This is actually what they do for their father as a family unit. And they go around all the back of hospitals, and um, they're sold the waste plastic by janitors um, who are doing this illegally inside the hospital and supplying these kids with these products, which then get washed, repackaged, and put back out onto the markets. And this is a scene that I see a lot, where obviously we thought that glass syringes had long gone, but in fact they're still used uh, in the most remote parts of the world, not everywhere. Um, but here's, here's an example with about 25 needles floating in lukewarm water. And each patient I watched came in and was asked the syringe was default. You only got that one syringe. But each, each patient was asked to pick a needle to put on the end of that and play Russian roulette, in effect. Now, this isn't a new uh, problem. This has been around for a long time. In fact, I read that the first uh, documented case of uh, transmission uh, was in the British Army in 1931, where 500 soldiers got malaria from one treatment program. Um, but it did roll on and have devastating consequences, which I'll tell you about. But one of the most poignant and recent examples is Ebola. Um, but this film is from 1976, and it features Dr. Peter Piot, who's the head of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who uh, was one of the first discoverers of um, the Ebola virus. And I just want to play you a very short clip. It took us a few hours to find out because we were a bunch of men. And, uh, but the difference between men and women between 20 and 30 is that women can get pregnant. And indeed, when we checked the hospital records, the records we had collected from the villages, um, it turned out that the excess of women at that age were all pregnant women. And they had all gone to the antenatal clinic. And then we wondered, but what happened there? And then it turned out that uh, nearly everybody received an injection. The problem was that there were only five syringes and needles. And so the same needles and syringes were reutilized every time. And so it's enough that one person with Ebola gets there, gets an injection for whatever reasons, and then the next one is, of course, directly infected. I won't make any comment about the recent outbreak, but of course, it did play a large part. 
Today, 1.3 million people die every year because of the reuse of syringes by medical practitioners. This is nothing to do with drug abuse. This is actually a nurse in a white coat who's trusted by that patient, delivering healthcare and doing it in an unsafe way. And there are many reasons that contribute to her or him doing that. And I actually firmly believe that she or he is not in any way malintentioned. 99% of the times they're put under impossible pressures which they find very hard to work with and therefore this situation arises. And just to put this into context, 1.3 million deaths is actually twice the number of, um, of deaths that are caused by malaria. Now my point is that malaria has billions of dollars put into it every single year. There are 300 people I think in WHO in the World Health Organization alone concentrating on malaria and millions around the world and there's probably one dealing with syringes. And it's a little bit um, untenable. You can't really understand why, because every country I go to, and I've been to, I think, 64, 65 in the last 10 years, you can buy a bottle of Coke for around 50 cents. And Coke is obviously everywhere. And syringes result, um, uh, sorry, the price of a syringe, you could buy 10 syringes for the price of a bottle of Coke. So a syringe is around five cents um, to purchase. So it just seems a little bit ridiculous that we blame the cost of a syringe or we blame the availability because Coke is available and you can buy them at a very, very cheap price. I started my journey in 1984. I was living in an um, in a, in a idyllic um, island in the Caribbean and I was making uh, models of murder scenes. And um, it sounds a bit weird, but when someone... <laughs> someone um, it was quite a violent island, and when people got bumped over the head or there were rapes, murders, car accidents and stuff, then one of the lawyers got the idea, and I was the first person sort of in the American legal system to do this. Uh, one, of, one of the lawyers said to me one day, hey, Mark, can you make a model? There was a murder, and I want to show it in court. And I ended up making this model, and we won this amazing out-of-court settlement. And, um, and what it gave me was an amazing confidence that I could do things with my hands and represent things and show them to people. And then soon after that, I read a newspaper article which predicted that um, one day um, HIV would be spread by syringes. And instantly I knew that's what I wanted to do. I spent the next three years uh, researching the problem, not the solution. And I felt that was very important because I didn't know anything about it. So how could I come up with a solution? So after studying everything from where does polypropylene come from that makes syringes, how is it refined from oil? And there was no internet, of course, so it wasn't like Jack's quick search on his smartphone. Um, I uh, researched everything from the, the raw materials all the way through to waste disposal. I went to immunization camps across Africa. I went to factories. I learned as much as I could and then came up with a very simple um, design and solution. And it lived on this mantra that it had to be made on exactly the same machinery because there were 600 or so factories around the world. Um, and there was no way I could go in and start building the 601st if it was going to challenge the 600. I wouldn't have lasted. It had to be made for the same cost, and it had to be used in exactly the same way to stand a chance of, of living and being a disruptive influence on the existing market. So I came up with this product. It's called K1. Um, sadly, we don't have any live cameras, so you'll just have to trust me at the back that this is happening. But this is one of our syringes. It's made on existing machinery, as I said, same price, same use. So you draw back, you remove the air, tap it, all the nasty things that you do, and then you inject. And after the injection's been given, if you try and refill it, it locks and then breaks and can't be reused again. So we've now gone on to license uh, uh, manufacturers around the world who had this set up, this existing equipment, and retrofit my design of moulding into their system. And the rest stays the same. And they pay a small royalty for each time they make one. We've managed now to uh, sell since uh, I started in 1984, sold the first syringe 17 years later in 2001. And since then, we're over four and a half billion of these syringes used around the world. And uh, we've been credited with saving, you know, possibly more than 10 million lives um, as an intervention over, over that course of time. But I thought it'd be interesting to tell you about why so long, because it took 17 years. 
And one of the key things here is that coming up with a disruptive technology <laughs> is by default disruptive. The real key that it took me a long time to work out, but the real key is that syringes are actually a loss leader in the medical products business. And even though it's hard for manufacturers to admit this, it is absolutely true. So the, the syringe is made for around three to three cents, let's say, and it's distributed at around five, as I mentioned earlier. A catheter, for example, is made for around three cents, but it's distributed at around 50 cents. So what the manufacturers have done is they've eked out this loss leader principle and they'll give away or they'll sell syringes at no margin at all. And that's, they're happy with that as long as they get the rest of their catalogue moved. So if Rory is the Minister of Health for Malawi, I'll come to him and I'll do a deal by giving him all next year's syringes as long as he supports the rest of my catalogue and buys the brand that I'm supporting because I'll make a lot of margin on the other products. So when I came along saying, hey, let's change the world and make it better. This is going to be great. We're going to save those 1.3 million lives. Everyone went, yeah, yeah, right. Because they would have to make more because they're reused. So to give everyone a sterile injection, they would have to double the size of their factories, which means spending capital. And they didn't want to do that because it gave them no more market access. It gave them exactly the same share of that Malawi market that we just mentioned. So there was no way that it was going to be an easy ride. So the manufacturers were against me. And in fact, we had several stories, as you might imagine, over those 17 years. Factories being bulldozed, even. Um, death threats from the most ridiculous sources that you might imagine. And offers of quite substantial amounts of money to sell the patent and, and, uh, so that it was buried. What happened in the end was that I was uh, able to meet Dr. Margaret Chan, who's the head of the World Health Organization. I tried for, I've now been in this business 31 years, as you can calculate, and I tried very hard to meet all the other DGs while I was uh, working, the director generals. And I was unsuccessful until I met Margaret Chan at a conference uh, three and a half years ago. And there I kind of jumped on her in the green room of where we were doing this presentation. And we had a bit of a tussle and, a, and an argument. And in the end, she agreed to see me. And when I went to Geneva, um, there was literally the atmosphere of you're the enemy to coming to see the chief. Anyway, after 10 minutes, Margaret said, this is absolutely fantastic. You've got a great idea. And I'm going to go along with it. And let's do it. So that was three years ago. And what the idea was, was that she would write the policy which would set the rules for this transition. And that the rules included putting pressure on all the international donors around the world who spend somewhere over $100 billion a year to put pressure on them to include safer syringes in their funding. And this was agreed. So people like DFID and USAID now have to pay attention to that policy. We also then went to the manufacturers, and we've just recently had a manufacturers meeting um, of getting all the manufacturers together and saying, this is going to happen whether you like it or not. And if you don't comply, if you don't make your loss leader safe, then you're not going to be in the game at all. So there's a lot at risk now that the top, top lady has spoken for the manufacturers. We also got compliance from the ministries of health. Over the three-year period that we uh, were preparing this, we were able to um, uh, go and research with over 50 ministries of health around the world about whether they would comply with this. And they've all agreed to do that. So we have a, a leading position there. And now we're building um, uh, programs which are going to influence healthcare workers and also public information campaigns which are going to allow the public to ask for the right syringe and the healthcare worker to agree that they're going to give the, the right syringe. As you might imagine from that video that, of Peter Piot back in, um, in uh, 1976, there's a discrepancy between the power of the healthcare worker and the power of the patient. And the power of the healthcare worker always wins. So here's me on the day of uh, the announcement. It happened on February the 23rd this year. Um, it was only the third ever global policy in WHO's 67-year history, and I was very proud of being the instigator for that. And we've adopted this branding here called Lifesaver, 
which will be printed on every syringe that complies with the regulations. There'll be a badge given to every healthcare worker. There'll be uh, all our advertising and branding around the world to the public will use the same branding as well so that they all link up and that we have that branding driving, driving the move. Now, just to bring us back to reality, I just want to show you one more video. In this video, you can see, which was taken undercover, you can see the nurse and her pride in having a beautiful white starched apron on, a nice white tray. And she picks up a syringe, which the medics in the audience will know didn't come from a packet. She just picked it up and used it. And she injects this four-year-old child with this injection, puts it back on the tray. The next patient is 18 years old, he's HIV, and he's got syphilis. And that's what he's being treated for at this moment. So again, she picks up the syringe, but you'll note that it's so blunt, it won't penetrate his skin easily, which means it must have been used over 20 times prior to being used on this gentleman. And after the injection, of course, the syringe is returned to the tray, but just please notice that it rolls to the left, just there, and hits those vials. So the next patient is a one-year-old baby in arms. She picks it up from that left-hand position and injects the baby. So this happened very recently. So from 1976 to now, we have made almost no progress at all. We've sold four and a half billion units, but in a market of 50 billion units, you can see that it's only just scratching the surface. So we need this uh, template, this checklist that we've written and the WHO have adopted to drive this through. One of the most important things that we found out in the three years of preparation is that this is going to save all the countries that adopt this policy a hell of a lot of money. We found out that for every dollar spent on syringes, waste disposal, training, $14 will be saved by having less disease in, in the marketplace in that country and less time off work increased GDP, less staffing stress. And in fact, we found that when we did a, um, when we did a, um, a trial, a five-year trial in, in Tanzania, that the average inpatient um, stay dropped from seven days to three simply by using auto-disabled syringes. And here comes the irony, because the manufacturers now don't actually have to make more, which was their problem. They always presume that if their syringe is being used more than once, maybe it's a sign of guilt, that they would have to increase their capacity. But in fact, they don't, because with better, safer injections, in given the way they're intended and the way that they're meant to be used, you can see that um, people are healthier, they don't get iatrogenic infections, and so they leave hospital quicker. The mandate that was introduced will come into full force around the world in 2020. And we've got five years now to handle all of those areas and align them and make sure that they work and literally change this whole industry. Thank you. Well, I was going to leave you with a question, but I didn't. No, I, I, I think Rory Sutherland is thinking, damn. <laughs> no, I hope. I'm, I'm sure not. So when there's a clearly proven, scientifically validated way of saving lives, and nobody really disputes that, um, how do we minimise that time lag in between idea, product, and activity in the field? You just go, it's all driven by profits. If you can make progress profitable, it will go faster. And so one of, the, one of my wishes would be, not because I want to gain more money from our royalty, although that wouldn't be bad, um, is we should up, up rate the value of an injection. Maybe it's a whole price with the drug and that we can return more profits to making better and better equipment. Um, but the, the trouble, the trick is that we've commoditized these products so they're always at the bottom of the scale. And um, that means that it's very hard to put the price back up. You can always go down but never up. So it's an amazing result. You're telling the story from the moment when things are starting to accelerate. Um, but during the 17 years before you'd kind of reached that major step, um, you must have felt like giving up a number of times. What kept um, you going? Yeah, I mean, in, even, even before we sold our first syringe, I was offered 
literally tens of millions to sell the patent, to keep it out of the transit, you know, to stop it transitioning um, the industry. Um, and no, I just thought that's why I'm here. You know, I'm here to, to make a bit of money, but also make a difference. And if the difference isn't going to be made, then I won't take the money. Final question. What can people here do to accelerate the rollout of this technology in the field? Um, we would love support of Lifesaver, the, the campaign. Um, monetary would be fantastic. We have a small charity called SafePoint, which is agnostic to any uh, brand. We, um, you know, we support all safety syringes that comply. And um, if any corporate or individual would like to support that, then I would be very happy to talk to them. Mark Koska, thank you very much. Thanks, David. <laughs>